and rolling. Let's go. Fantastic. So welcome everybody to our fourth one, isn't it? Third or fourth? Fourth session fourth, of the yeah. PS Platypus Mega Quiz series. We're covering multiple systems now because we're getting to the slightly well, not less important systems, but the smaller systems, the ones that have less conditions in them and things that hopefully should be easier to study, like self-study. But we've tried to make these questions a little bit more challenging for you, trying to incorporate a few interesting concepts, especially in this case, we're looking at investigations and management in a lot more detail than you may have already covered. And today we're covering HPB and genitourinary. So without any further ado, let's get right into the questions. As always, feel free to unmute if you'd like to ask us questions or if you want to continue with the traditional way of answering questions which is just typing in the chat um, either one is fine so let's get into it question number one starting off with a nice set of um, blood results so a patient is brought into the ed by ambulance after being found barely conscious on the street he's a poor historian but you note that he has a tender and enlarged liver scleral jaundice and bilateral dupuytren's contractures so hopefully you have an idea of what all of these things mean you perform blood tests and lfts which are shown below and i've been nice enough to include reference values just kidding they always pro provide you with reference values you don't need to remember the them i don't think right james they're usually pretty good with that yeah they typically give you reference values okay Brilliant. We've I already got a few people coming with Honestly, answers. reference values, it's like, with the exception of, I, I think it is useful like from a clinical perspective to know the basic reference values um, for stuff like phone consults and whatever. But like yeah. for reading results, it's sort of like, you know, the, you'll never have a calculator in your pocket of medicine. Mm. Like the reference values will be there in almost every situation you're in. So don't stress too much yeah. about them. Absolutely. I would not have memorized LFTs. I haven't memorized LFTs. Like that's not something that's yeah, you can know like the, you, you'll know the rough ranges. Um, yeah. yeah. And in fact, that's what matters more in the end. Like you're not gonna uh, I'm sure once you know on placement, if you talk to your regs and your consultants, they'll be like, you know, you're not gonna make a, a decision uh, based purely on is it, you know, 44 versus 46 AST, right? Um you have to take Absolutely. the whole thing into into account. Good. Uh, on that note, everyone, I know we've got a few people already answering, which is great. Um, for those who haven't yet or are still wanting to think about it, whenever you're ready, please chuck your answers in the chat, either in the public chat or to myself directly. Fantastic. Okay, so we're getting a lot of D, which is great. So we're looking at a picture of alcoholic liver disease. Can someone tell me what are two two or three things maybe that you've looked at here that are more specific to alcoholic liver disease over just general liver problems? Yeah, so we've got the dupoitrines. Um, you get those contractures in the hands and it's bilateral. So it's unlikely to be something local to one hand. And yes, we've also got the ratio of ALT and AST. Um, and yeah, fantastic. So high GGT as well. So just to clarify with the ratio, AST um, being classically much higher than ALT, and it's still being a hepatic hepatocellular damage picture, um, is very good, like in terms of exam technique, or very specific for alcoholic liver disease. Um, and GGT being elevated with no elevation in ALP is very unlikely to be a cholestatic picture. It's more likely that the alcohol is contributing to the GGT. So we've got those three or four things that are helping us um, or guiding us towards alcoholic liver disease over everything else. Well done. So next question. A pa Again, we've got a few blood tests, but just to give you an idea of what's happening, a patient has come to your GP for regular checkup. They've got malaise and a low-grade fever. Um, one year ago, you had an appointment and he admitted to IV drug use, but since then he has been clean. On examination, there is enlarged tender hepatomegaly and a generalized jaundice. So you perform your liver function test as you do and a viral panel as shown below. So just have a read of these blood results. And if you have a system to work through your common serologies for hepatitis, try and use them here and see if you can get to the right answer. So we're looking at a hepatitis A and a hepatitis B serology. I might give you a little bit more time with this one. And whenever you're ready, feel free to um, send your answers. Already got a few 
very fast fingers on their keyboards. Very good. I'll still give you maybe about 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds just to finish off for anyone who's still thinking about it. Fantastic. You guys are very, very quick. So that's good. So the answer here is going to be B. Um, the things that help you is, well, first of all, it's really good to have in your head a flow chart for how to work through hepatitis B serologies. It's a very high yield sort of common thing you'll come across in exams plus potentially real life. Um, the way that I like to think about it, um, and I might include a diagram of this in the events page later on, a bit of a hand-drawn thing because it's a bit harder to do on Zoom. But essentially, I guess for this one, if you have an isolated hepatitis B um, Oh, what time does the Zoom end? Well, hopefully sooner than 7.30, we're hoping. It, it shouldn't be helps. later than that based on yeah, the number of yeah. questions. Yeah. So um, isolated anti-hepatitis B surface is like being isolated positive. The reason why that happens is because when you're getting your vaccination done, that's essentially what the vaccine is trying to, well, it contains, and it's going to increase the amount of that antibody that's in your serum without anything else being increased. Anytime you have the core antibodies increasing, that's more likely to be an actual infection. But the way that you tell if it's an acute infection is if you actually have the antigens in the system, which here is undetectable. That's not a very good way of actually explaining a thought process, but I will actually include a diagram that was very helpful to me back in third year to make this a lot easier for anyone who's struggling. Um, but in this case, just remember, isolated positive anti-HBS, that's vaccination. Now with um, the other hepatitis variants, the serologies are much easier, um, especially like, you know, with um, hepatitis A, you, there's no such thing as chronic hepatitis A. So if there's any um, responses there that say chronic, that's wrong. Um, and you only really have to look at whether it's IgM or IgG. The way that I remembered which one is which is I remember IgM being me first like M for me first. So that's the one that comes out first. It's like the acute infection. And IgG, um, I just remember like GG, like this is like the strongest one. Like this is the one that really comes out later on once your body has properly recognized the pathogen. And it's like, we've got to send out the big guns now. That's when IgG comes out. Hopefully that, that's a terrible way of remembering it, but it's the way that stuck for me. So IgM being positive, but IgG being negative means it's an acute infection. And that's most likely what is leading them to have this viral hepatitic um, picture with the tender hepatomegaly, jaundice, etc. Not so much hepatitis B. So that's why the answer here is going to be B. And we've got another um, great way of remembering it from someone else in the comments. IgM being M for immediate, if that helps anyone. And then IgG is obviously going to be the other one. G I said comments, gradual. didn't I? G for gradual, yes. Also, I didn't mean to say comments. I meant chat. Nice. Okay, fantastic. This is, this is one of mine. Yes, um, yeah. yeah. So have a look at this. Um, this is PSA testing. Um, really, I think for third year, all you should really need to know um, is uh, like PSA levels and um, free to total ratio. Um, and that's literally what it says on the, on the tin. So um, the you just put numerator, free PSA, denominator, total PSA, um, you know, what percentage? You know, we're talking 10, 15, 20, something bigger than that. So have a think um, and see what you guys reckon the answer is. So I am still getting direct messages for this one. So I may convey what the what everyone's saying. I'll, I'll give them um, a couple seconds more and then we'll, we'll uh, yeah. see what people... I'm getting a couple cool. filtering now. Fantastic. All right, if you um, haven't sent your answer through now, feel free to do it now and I'll see what people are thinking. Okay. All right, I'm getting a fair bit of D. Is that what you're, you're getting as well, Jan? Yeah, yeah a few perfect. A's mixed in there, but few mostly A's. D. Interesting. Okay, sure. All right, well, I'm glad nobody went for meta metastatic prostate cancer. Um, now, um, I'll I've got a couple of things to talk about here. Now, we'll talk about PSA first of all. Um, there is one more PSA question on here, so I hope it will help you with that one. Um, so... PSA in general being up, uh, being elevated just means something's going on with the prostate. Um, so 
almost any number of things that happen to the prostate can increase your PSA. Um, the big things that you guys need to care about, um, prostate cancer, you know, big bad thing that we don't want to have, um, benign prostatic hyperplasia, BPH, um, and prostatitis. Okay, so um, any of those things can increase P PSA. For that reason, um, PSA elevated on its own doesn't necessarily tell you too much. Um, you have to look at the history partially, um, and you also have to look at um, the free PSA. So in simple terms, the like all you guys really need to get with this is that it's better to have more free PSA. It's worse to have less free PSA. Okay, um, so when we talk about the ratio, you'll get different like opinions from different people on it but like roughly 15 percent or so um is sort of the the level at which we think if it's lower than 15 percent um it's more likely to be prostate cancer than anything else um whereas anything higher than that in this case it's like uh i think like 40 percent or something um ratio of, of free to total um that means it's more likely to be something else in this case um probably bph based on the symptoms um and the fact that it's four years so if this had been like over the past couple of weeks and he's also got you know a fever or something then we're more thinking prostatitis um but the fact that we've had a long gradual um progression of symptoms means we're more likely to have um a bph presentation um, another thing to understand um, really quickly, and this is the only thing, bit of pro prostate anatomy that you guys should really need to know, um, but in general terms, um, BPH is a uh, it results in growth around the urethra, so in the sort of central zone of the prostate, which is why you get all of those um, urine symptoms. Prostate cancer usually happens in the peripheral zone of the prostate. Um, which is to say the outside zone of the prostate. So it is, act although yes, prostate cancer can present with urinary symptoms, it actually doesn't have to. So you can get prostate cancer without urinary symptoms. Um, and in many cases, by the time you do get urinary symptoms in prostate cancer, it uh, means that it's actually quite uh, well progressed. Okay. Um, the good thing about um, it being in the peripheral zone means that it's easier to actually find on DRE. Um, so it's easier to um, to detect it that way. Uh, but yeah, so in general terms, we have an elevated PSA, something's going on, um, but we have a lot of free PSA and it's a non-acute history. So BPH is the most appropriate um, diagnosis here. Somebody asked, so free PSA is less than 15% of total PSA, more likely to be cancer. Yeah, but you, obviously, you know, you've got many more, st more steps on the diagnosis um, than just the PSA test. It's a screening test, mm -hmm. not a diagnostic test. Good Wonderful bit of anatomy that you've added on there, James. So thank you for that. Here is the next one. I think this is you as well. I think it is me. So yeah, yeah have a look. Um, there's some slightly buzzwordy stuff in here, but there's also a decent bit of interpretation. So have a go. Interpreting LFTs is a very, very, very high yield thing for you guys. Like I think there would have been I don't know, Jenna, you reckon there were like at least four or five questions that related to LFT interpretation? Yeah. And if you practice them enough, that's like four easy marks. So I would encourage you to really, you know, understand those ratios and things that we're talking about, what it means for it to be liver damage versus something like cholestatic. Just those sorts of basic principles will go a long way when it comes to interpreting these questions and it, if it gets more complicated, definitely. Mm, yeah. Yeah. 100%. Was that a call from faculty saying we're going to put four more questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, LFT it is. Questions? Absolutely. <laughs> Okie dokie. I've got a couple um, suggestions. If anyone else is waiting to send through the answer, feel free to do it now. Okay, okay, I'm getting a lot of A, um, which is the correct answer. So the biggest tell on this one is look at that ALT and AST. That is huge. That's massive, right? Um, so even if you're sitting here with, you know, really bad um, alcoholic liver disease, um, maybe you have a bit of an elevated, you know, AST, um, and it'll likely be AST over ALT, stubbies over liver, but um, it's not going to be 700, 800, 1,000, right? You can actually, you know, not unreasonably get over 1,000 um, in ALT on an acute viral hepatitis. And that's basically the only thing that will raise it to that level. Um, 
the in terms of why he actually has it, um, the travel history is the most um relevant thing here. So your A and D um hep are the ones that you get from doing um basically you go off and you you travel and you eat something weird um and you end up with it. So A and E. Um and then your your B and C are the ones that you get from um drug use, sexual contact, all of that sort of stuff. Okay. Um yeah, somebody asked, what's with the rash skin thing? Ha ha, all right, I've tricked you. So um, forearms are excoriated. That just means he's been scratching them. And he's been scratching them because he has jaundice, because he is um, hepatitic. So he's got jaundice, um, which is why he's got the icterus. Um, he's um, getting itching as a result of it. And so he hasn't got jaundice per se. He's got symptoms of it. Um, so he's got icterus and he's got um, um, itching. And as a result, he's, you know, scratching up his forearms. Um, but yeah, good stuff. Fantastic. And while we're just talking about LFTs, I don't think we have a question on this, but if we do, James, please stop me. Um, I don't want to spoil anything. Um, but you guys might be familiar that some of these liver function tests are not as effective in evaluating liver damage if a patient is already in like chronic liver failure. So they're, sometimes the liver can sort of adapt to chronic insults. And, and when you do a blood test on someone with chronic liver problems, sometimes the ALT, AST, ALP, GGT might just be all normal or relatively normal. Does anyone know what is a better way of, or what is a better blood test to order if we're trying to figure out if a liver is not functioning properly, aside from these sort of more indirect um, blood tests? Hopefully that's a sort of well-worded question. Yeah, nice. Okay, so a lot of you are getting it. So we're, we're thinking about blood tests that are looking at the synthetic function of the liver rather than just looking at like hepatocellular damage and all that sort of stuff. So the main thing that we're thinking about, yes, albumin is a really good one, which is already here actually, I didn't realize, um, but also coags. Um, so INR and all that sort of stuff is very good um, in a patient with chronic liver problems instead of these ones that can sometimes look falsely normal. So well done. Just a bit of a clinical pearl. All right, next question. So no um, blood results or anything to look at. I just want you to have a read of this and try and see if you can recognize the, the very sort of important signs of this, again, very important condition. So once you're ready, paste your answers in the chat. I'll give you about 30 seconds. Okay, let me open the chat. I think I've got a few. Yeah, brilliant. So the answer here is definitely E. And someone has pointed out that we are looking at Charcot's triad. So can someone write in the chat, what is Charcot's triad? What are the three things? The three things that we're seeing here. Yeah, brilliant. Fever, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain. Does anyone know what two additional signs you might look for in uh, Reynolds Pentad? Yeah, hypotension and shock. So that's telling us this might this is obviously worse. There might be a sort of septic component to it. But in this case, we don't really have that. We just have the three things, right? So we have our Charcot's triad. And that tells us this is most likely going to be ascending cholangitis. Um, we've got a, a ton of risk factors here, the biggest of which I guess would be the recurrent gallstones. Um, so that all of it's pointing towards that one diagnosis. You still want to keep the other ones in the back of your mind because we know it's something to do with the liver or the... Um, biliary tree. Well done. Next question. So while you're reading this, I just got an interesting question, which I don't really know the answer to, but I might pose it to the rest of the platypi because why not? Um, three brains are better than one. So does having a cholecystectomy increase the risk of cholangitis? My gut feeling is Actually, you know what? It's not even good to have a gut feeling because like, you know, I feel like I should have an answer to this rather than just telling you what I think. Um, I will look into this. It's a good question. I, don't, I can't say I know the numbers on that. It's not a, a yeah. thing that I, <laughs> that I frequently look I would up. hope the surgeons are pretty good with their cholecystectomy so that <laughs> you don't get this sort of problem happening. But I'm sure I'm, I'm get, my gut feeling is telling me there's probably going to be a slight increased risk because any surgery carries risks and there surely are going to be a few. Oh, wait, in, in the acute phase or in the um, 
the long term? I'm actually unsure. I'm very, I'm quite unsure. I, I'd feel like just not having a gallbladder um, should surely reduce your, your risk of, you know, somebody's probably done a study. Some medical student yeah. scraping from a location has probably done a study. <laughs> I've heard of multiple instances of um, uh, post-cholecystectomy gallstones and like gallstones can actually sometimes increase in their occurrence after a cholecystectomy. Um, cholangitis though is, is interesting. I'm not too sure. Hmm. I'd imagine like after you remove the gallbladder, you'd also remove a bit of the cystic duct as well. So maybe you do, I'd imagine you'd like reduce the incidence almost because you have less landscape to infect. But then again, you, you know, you, the, you know, have... the biggest problem with this, you know, the single biggest problem with this, you will never be able to do a proper RCT on this because no, you, you know, you can't just do a colostectomy on somebody unless they already have, um, you know, stones or, yeah. or, 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 or colcystitis. So you, you know, mm. you will never get an uh, equal, oh, you know what? You could do like only people who've had, but even then, like if you were to try to find somebody who, for the, like the non-operative arm, um, then you have to find people who were like, you know, they had colcystitis or they have stones and they haven't had an operation. But even that means that it wasn't as bad. So yeah. it'd be really tricky. Be like you yeah. have, you basically have to assume that there's a bunch of people who like we just sort of did cholecystectomies on because maybe. Long story short, we're not sure and we're slightly waffling all of us together. <laughs> but um it'll be a hard question to answer. It'll be a very hard question to answer. Yes. Um right. speaking of hard to questions to answer, <laughs> we have this question which um was hotly debated before, just like a few hours prior to this session. So I'm interested to see what you guys have to say. Um, paste your answers in the chat again. How would we manage this particular patient? Fantastic. So I've got a, a big mix of um, responses here, which is what I was expecting. Although a few of you have pointed out the answer that I think would be most correct. And also a few of you have pointed out an answer which um, some of the rest of us in the team have thought is correct. So I'm actually quite happy with that. Um, essentially what we have here is we have a patient who has renal colic and we're worried that this is due to renal stones. Okay, so that's the, the main sort of basic thing we're thinking about. Um, and obviously they're in quite a lot of pain. We also have a situation where this is not just your regular renal colic with the, like stones that are causing pain, but we also have damage somewhere along the renal tract. We've got elevated ser serum creatinine, urinalysis is showing blood, and we've also done imaging studies. Um, I would think it's an ultrasound. And we've got um, dilatation. We've got hydronephrosis. We've got periureteral edema. So there's inflammation, potentially a super infection on top of the stone. So this is a complicated nephrolithiasis, a complicated kidney stone. So while in a normal kidney stone, we have multiple options. We can do ESWL. So that's just the shock waves that are trying to break up from the outside the stone and let it pass through. That's an option. We also have just uh, surgically going in either percutaneously or whatever and trying to get rid of that stone, whether it's extraction or whether it's with laser removal. But the problem with all of those is that they're, they're great for simple cases. If you have signs of infection, then oftentimes breaking them up or trying to remove them can actually just spread the infection and make it worse. So, And you've also got a situation where this is blocking the ureter leading to retrograde flow and now you've got a dilated pelvis. So that's like That's a big problem. The first thing you need to do, for example, like if you think about conditions like acute cholangitis, sorry, ascending cholangitis, um, oftentimes the first thing you need to do is decompress that region to try and reduce the pressure, make it easier to perform surgery or other interventions later on. So in this case, that's why the answer is D, is that you would want to first, or at least at the same time as your surgical intervention, whatever it is, you'd want to place a stent to reduce that overall pressure on the, the kidneys and prevent further damage. Now, the, for the people who've done C, um, this is the, so C and D was kind of what we were thinking about as well before this. And I guess that's why I've tried to specify as much as possible here that this is a complicated case. But if you did pick C, that's totally fine. Look, ultimately, at, at the end of the day, this is like a specialist decision. It won't be something that we do as interns or regs at the moment. Um, so it's a really difficult question. I just want you to know or be, be aware that the management surgical approach is very different for a complicated versus an uncomplicated um, kidney stone situation so hopefully that helps but it's a very difficult question so I apologize for that if you want to read up more on it there's a, a really fantastic 
list of criteria on up to date for each of those um each of those therapies. So that can be quite helpful. Moving on, here's the next question. And apologies if I'm missing questions that you guys are asking in the chat along the way. Um, I will try and answer them as best as I can when I'm not um, talking as much. Um, but rest assured, I will get to them. So 60-year-old patient, uh, recurrent episodes of right upper quadrant, abdominal pain, jaundice, and dark urine. Lab tests show elevated liver enzymes, bilirubin, and ALP levels. Ultrasound shows gallstones in the gallbladder and common bile duct with a diameter of 10 millimeters. There's no guiding, no peritonism. The patient is afebrile and hemodynamically stable. What is the most appropriate next step? So again, whenever you're ready, please feel free to paste your answers in the chat. Fantastic. I think we're all thinking along, or most of us are thinking along the same track. Um, just out of curiosity, does anyone, I'm not sure if you've had um, gen surge, actually most of you might have had gen surge rotations already, or some surge rotations. Have you ever come across the sort of, um, like the diameters of the common bile duct? Because I remember there was like some practice going around where you needed to know cutoffs for what is considered a dilated common bile duct and what is not, just for your, your interest. Um, usually, it's like there's an age differentiation. So generally speaking, younger patients, we look at six millimeters or more. Um, I think the cutoff is like 50 years or something like that. Someone can check. Um, in older patients, we're looking at eight millimeters or more. And if you've had surgical um, interventions, then I think the threshold is a little bit higher. So regardless of what those numbers are, this is a very dilated bile duct. And we don't really need to worry about that because we can already see gallstones. So this is a cholidocolithiasis, dilated common bile duct, most likely obstructive. However, this patient is hemodynamically stable with no other features. So if there were other features, we may be going into an urgent open cholecystectomy, which is fair enough. But because they're fine, generally speaking, the gold standard for a cholidocolithiasis is a therapeutic ERCP. So of course, ERCP has diagnostic potential as well. That's why it's so good, because if you're already diagnosing it, you may as well treat it with the same thing. It has its own risks of course, but it's the gold standard. You wouldn't only rely on antibiotics because obviously there's something there you need to get rid of it. You wouldn't reassure because um, this is not something, like while they might be stable right now, it's clearly causing them a lot of abdominal pain. So you wouldn't just say, go away and come back in two weeks because it can get infected or worse. Liver biopsy really doesn't have any role here. So the answer here is A. Well done. Here's the next one. So there's this... Um, in the HPV section, neatly tucked away under one of the R3 conditions is your like a genetic and inflammatory liver conditions. And it, I guess it's R3 there, but they do still like to test it. Um, a few of these conditions, it's just important to know what they are and what sort of things you can expect. So hopefully this, these couple of questions um, get you halfway there in terms of understanding these ones. 17 year old liver dysfunction, dysarthria, dystonia, Dr notes a greenish brown ring around the periphery of the iris and I've included a picture there for your reference. Abnormal liver function tests and also low serum seruloplasmin eh, levels. So what do we think is happening? And can someone name what these rings are called? Yeah, Ka Kaiser Fletcher is close. <laughs> it's Kaiser Fletcher. Um, and we're looking at Wilson's disease, which is your like sort of copper overload, copper deposition. And it's not just the eyes, like that's the one that we see overtly, but um, you can see that this person also has dysarthrias, dystonias. Um, sometimes this can deposit um, in and around the brain, so intracranially, and that can be quite problematic. And the ceruloplasmin levels, that's just a buzzword for you guys. If you come across it, um, that's talking about um, copper levels, or rather it's talking about like in the same way that you look at haptoglobin or something, or like anemia, seruloplasmin is kind of cleaning up excess um, copper. So that's why you have low levels of them. Hopefully that makes sense. And also I'd encourage you to review each of these conditions that I've talked about, except for tertiary syphilis, which is not really relevant to um, HPV yet. Another one that's very similar. So 48 year old female patient presents with fatigue, pruritus and hepatomegaly. There's yellow deposits behind her elbows and around her eyes. 
joint stiffness due to rheumatoid arthritis. Blood tests that you've ordered show there's a raised ALP and the presence of a raised biomarker, and so the patient is considered for liver biopsy. So given what you think the most likely diagnosis is, and I know I haven't given you a lot, um, which marker is likely to have been tested? And also, if you can, what do you think this patient has? Wonderful. Well done. So the answer here is going to be B. We're looking at AMAs. And so AMAs are not like super specific for like lots of conditions. Um, lots of autoimmune conditions can have positive AMA. But in here, we're dealing with a patient who has what we think is primary biliary um, cirrhosis or primary biliary cholangitis. I, can't, I can never remember which one is correct, but it's PBC. And I guess what gives it away is a lot of these risk factors, especially these um, yellow deposits, which are the fatty deposits around the elbows and the eyes. They've also got another autoimmune condition. And of course, it's the raised ALP, as well as the indication for a liver biopsy. So it has to be something sort of genetic or inflammatory. Um, P anchor, C anchor, ANAs, and ACAs, they're also uh, in a lot of different ways relevant to the hepatobiliary system. Um, but I would encourage you to read up on these rather than me talking through each and every one of them, just in case we come across a question later on. But they're also very, very useful in terms of buzzwords. So just know them if you can. And I'm glad no one said it's um, PSC, because sometimes those can get confused very easily. So just know PSC is very different, and we'll, we might come across it later on. Well done. Okay. Another patient, 57-year-old, unexplained tiredness and polyuria. As he walks into the room, you notice a startling brown discoloration of his skin, which he says started earlier this year. Alongside some abdominal pain, he's embarrassed to admit that he has had some issues with erectile dysfunction, which is distressing him. Given the most likely diagnosis, again, I haven't given you a lot, but we're thinking in the realm of HPV, what could be happening? Which of the following is not true? So again, take your time. And once you're ready, paste your answers in the chat. I can see I've stumped a few people. Take your time, no worries. This is a bit of a longer question. I apologize. <laughs> no clue, this is hard. Yep, <laughs> sorry. Brilliant, well done. So it's good that everyone has read through all the options rather than kind of jumping to one. And um, yeah, some of these options you may not have even known, but you've gotten to the, one of the options that is obviously wrong, which is fantastic. So the answer here is D. Um, and a lot of you have correctly pointed out in a similar way to what we were talking about with the copper, like Wilson's disease, you may you will have raised ferritin because this is iron, um, but the TIBC levels, total iron binding capacity will be low because what you have is you have all of the iron being soaked up already. And so the binding capacity, which is additional capacity to soak up more of that iron is gonna be low. If that helps to think about it. So you have low amounts of TIBC or low TIBC, sorry. Um, which is like kind of the opposite situation to iron deficiency anemia, if you think about it. Genetic testing can be done, definitely. The commonest cause is actually liver cancer, so HCC. He will probably need lifelong phlebotomy, or he can have, so this is likely need, but sometimes you can actually have iron chelation um, medications. And secondary causes uh, definitely can include frequent blood transfusions. Fantastic, but most cases are hereditary. Awesome. Next question. A patient with known chronic liver failure presents to the ED with nausea, acute abdominal pain, distended abdomen, visible veins around the anterior abdominal wall. So what are we thinking is happening? While he's being assessed, he violently retches up some bright red vomit. The patient is taken straight to theater and stabilized with endoscopic variceal ligation, which stops the bleeding completely. This is not as, um, like this is a really important knowledge or just medicine in general. Um, it's not something that Monash historically asks of a lot. So it's okay if you're not sure, but it's just really good information to have.
Brilliant. So you guys already know this. So that's fantastic. Um, hopefully you've had some exposure to HPB stuff in your placements. So you may know that prevention, well, first of all, what's going on? Like what, what does this person have most likely? What's the condition? Yeah, they have a variceal bleed, most likely secondary to some sort of portal hypertension situation. So they've got a variceal bleed um, specifically in the esophagus. Um, and the way that you can prevent this is with a, um, a beta blocker. You want a non-specific beta blocker, as someone has highlighted. So it has to be propanolol. Metoprolol is specific mostly to the heart. So we use that in a lot of heart conditions, which is why it's not really relevant here. So that's why the answer is E for prevention. Octreotide, so D, and terlipressin, which is A. Those are medications that can be used in the moment, so acute management. Um, clearly, so the, I haven't mentioned it. They may have used it, but in this case, they've just opted for endoscopic ligation. But in terms of um, prevention, it's definitely propanolol. So well done to everyone for that. Here's the next one. It's the bottom line. So we've got a patient who um, seems at first glance to be a respiratory patient, but shock horror uh, turns out to be a, a renal patient. So first part of this is what do you think is going on? And then we'll have to find out what the appropriate treatment will be based on that. Getting a couple answers trickling in, trickling in. Okay, all right, people are on the right path. Give you guys a couple more seconds and then we'll talk about it. Cool. All right. So most people went with E, um, which is in fact correct. Um, and most people seem to have also identified uh, the pathology correctly. So this is anti-GBM. Um, the respiratory symptoms are the dead giveaway here. Um, this is a nephritic syndrome. It's a subset of glomerulonephritis. Um, and because, well, can anyone tell me, um, and this would have been on your path exam actually, um, what the, uh, the actual pathophysiology here is? Like what's happening down on the cellular level to cause this? Why are the kidneys getting screwed? Okay. What's actually causing the damage in this disease? Yeah, good. So autoantibodies. Okay. So um, the idea is this is so anti-GBM slash good pastures. Um, and the basic idea is that you have autoantibodies against both pulmonary alveoli. So that's why we've got all this stuff happening with the lungs, the symptoms and the um, x-ray changes, and also against um, the, the kidneys. Um, and therefore we have a GN and we also have respiratory symptoms. Um, so because um, the... Uh, the uh, actual cause of agent is the antibodies. We need to do a plasmapheresis in order to get those out of the system. Um, so that, that's the main reason why we're doing that. Um, sulfamethoxazole is on here many, many times. Um, and that's because it's an immunosuppressant. It's not the only immunosuppressant you can use. You can also use trimethoprim for the same purpose. Um, but that's it for all here. Um, prednisone and sulfamethoxazole you can use for certain things. So some things you don't need to, um, obviously you don't always need to do plasmapheresis based on the pathophys. Um, giving in uh, benzo benpen and that sort of stuff is obviously in cases where um, you've got a, a post-infectious uh, disease or where there's a post-infectious disease where the disease, sorry, where the infection is actually ongoing, but you've got the, um, the GN showing up during the course of the disease. Um, anyone know why you'd give albumin real quick? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, nephrotic. Yeah, perfect. So because you lose protein in nephrotic syndrome, um, you're giving the albumin to maintain the oncotic pressure. So yeah, good stuff. Uh, perfect. Okay. Um, somebody asked why. Uh, real quick. Um, somebody asked why it's not. Um, well, it's not GPA. Um, so GPA. That's um. You would potentially get some um respiratory symptoms. It's hard. It's a bit hard to um to tease it out on a um a like without any pathology just looking at the symptoms um but you don't you don't see any of the associated symptoms that you might have with gpa so uh, there's no rash there's no myalgia there's no neuropathy um and so on the balance of probability um you're probably going to um be looking at anti gbm and particularly like the the um the hemoptysis and hematuria um combination is is um very suggestive of anti GBM. We will have a question on GPAs and other PAs later on as well. So Ooh. that might help. There you go. Um this is another PSA test. So armed with your knowledge from before, hopefully you guys are absolutely on top of this one. Right, if you're waiting to send the answer, feel free to do so now. I'm getting a couple things trickling in that are on the right track. Yeah, good, perfect. Okay, so... um. PSA is a screening test, not a diagnostic test. And therefore, if we see a PSA elevated in the context of absolutely nothing else, so he's got no findings on DRE, um, he's got no urinary symptoms, he's got no loss of weight, lymphadenopathy, anything like that, um, you do repeat PSA. So the correct answer is E. Um, we're not going to transperineal biopsy until the point where we already have scans, and we're not doing scans until we have... Um, to you know, at least two ideally um, elevated PSAs. Um, when we do a repeat PSA, we also want to ideally do a free PSA. Um, so because, like I said before, um, that free to total percentage tells us a lot about, um, or a fair bit at least about um, whether it's likely to be a um, a uh, cancer or a BPH. Somebody asked, do you have to ask for a free PSA separately? So, um, yeah, so you can just do PSA, um, and that is the type that will be done on um, your typical screening test. Uh, but when you order the repeat PSA for somebody who's got an elevated PSA, um, you will say, you know, total and free to total ratio, or just free PSA, and then you can calculate the ratio pretty easily. Good stuff. Another one of mine. Um, yeah, interesting little one. I don't know if I can call it interesting if I wrote it. I, I mean, you are, these are all questions. These are all questions where it starts off with one system and then you're like, no way it can be linked to HPV, genital urinary, and it somehow is. So and that's why nephrology is the heart of the hospital. <laughs> Best specialty. <laughs> Love me a good GFA. Okay, so... Um, yeah, I think we were all on roughly the right um, track. Feel free to send your answer through if you haven't already, but all of the stuff I'm getting is A, which is good. Um, so you guys probably, if I have to guess, remember your muddy brown cast, pathognomonic, uh, for acute tubular necrosis. 
Anyone know what type of cells um, those muddy brown casts are? Yeah, so it's the tubular cells of the epithelium um, that have died um, and are now, you know, sloughing off. Um, so you don't necessarily need to have hematuria in ATN. Um, this is important to remember. Um, the anyone also anyone able to tell me why um, she has ATN? Yep, getting a lot of yeah. Yeah, so she has she had cardiogenic shock, hyper hypoperfusion of the kidneys, and she's now got an AKI, um, and obviously ATN intravenal cause. Um, so this is hopefully a self resolving thing with time, but you you obviously give her supportive therapy during the actual thing. Um, but yeah, no, that's the that's the diagnosis. Well done, everyone. I think coming fresh off the back of um, renal pathology is very helpful for these questions. So you guys are smashing it. Here is the next one, which again is not mine. I think it's you, James. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I did not double these super the well. <laughs> All right. Have a go at this one. Endo and, and nephro are very, very closely linked. I also did have an interesting question, which you, James, you might be able to help out with. Um, they so someone has asked um, if this sort of situation from the previous question could also be because of contrasts that are used in the cath lab. So those like iodinated contrasts. Ooh, um, no, that's I mean that's a good question. So the overwhelming answer that I've heard from people re um, MRI contrast. Uh, and CT, sorry, not MRI contrast, CT contrast, um, is that it is all made up and not true uh, regarding contrast-induced in nephropathy. However, I don't know if they use different contrasts in cath lab. I'd need to double check that. Um, mm. so yeah, I don't know if it'd be high in the differential. Um, I'd need to check what if they use a different contrast and if that has been shown to be nephrotoxic. But at least as far as I know... Um, contrast in, like contrast induced nep nephropathy is a bit of a shaky diagnosis these days. Controversy, I like it. All right, so woof, we have a few different answers to this one, which I love to see. Always fun. So, um, okay, we'll start with the correct answer, and then we'll talk about why it's correct. So, the correct answer here is ramipril plus dapagliflozin. Um, so ramipril um is a ACE inhibitor. Dapagliflozin is an SGL two inhibitor. Um, as for why we're doing it, so. You guys probably have already heard, you know, at some point if you've been around cardiologists um, for a tutor or whatever, you've heard them raving about SGLT2. They're good for the kidneys. Um, they've got lots of, you know, morbidity benefits in people with kidney disease and um, hypertension. Um, sorry, no, and and uh, di diabetes. Um, so they're a very, very good drug for us to pick. Um, something like um, uh, ramipril and verapapil is not unreasonable in the community. Um, candesartan spironolactone that's more to do with heart failure and she doesn't really have heart failure at least we, you know maybe she does we don't know that from the stem um, printerpil plus sodalol maybe it'd be a bit of a weird um, um, regime to put someone on just straight ahead uh, rapamol plus sodalol I'm actually not sure if sodalol is cardioselective or not but if it's not cardioselective then that is a big no-no <laughs> yeah so in simple terms um in a case where you have um, a patient who's diabetic um, and needs some hypertension meds, that's when you get to pull out your SGLT2 because that's a solid indication for it. Fantastic. Here is your next question. This is more of an acute presentation. Oh, so someone has asked, so what was the final answer for the previous one? Oh, Let me sorry, just go back B. quickly. Did I not say B? B was the final answer. Yeah. No, no, you did. Yep. So I think these are like the reno friendly drugs, basically, and also good for diabetes. Okay. 
So we've got a, a cute presentation. We've got a 14 year old boy. He's been crying constantly for the last hour and complaining of lower abdo pain. He's not tender in the iliac fossa, but on examination of the testes, you notice that the right testis is swollen, tender and elevated. Um, you rotate the testis laterally at the bedside, which you, you can do, and it reduces the pain and the parents are pretty happy about that because obviously the pain is lower. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step though, now that you've helped this patient? Fantastic. Well done, everyone. So I'm glad no one said reassure and discharge because your job is not done. Yes, the pain is reduced, but you're not actually sure how severe this um, presentation is. You may have only like half fixed it. And also there might be a situation where this testis is already compromised. So it might already be ischemic. And the problem with that is if you're just gonna leave it there, um, not only is it now like a dead piece of tissue that's inside a patient's body, but you've also compromised the blood testis barrier. And that's a problem because you can have autoimmune reaction to that testis and then you can get infertility, et cetera. So it's, it's not worth the risk of just leaving it there even though you've partially solved it. So yes, the best thing you need to do is immediately as soon as possible, try and get this patient down for surgery. Have a look at the affected side as well as the unaffected side and see if there's any signs of ischemia. You may also consider um, orchidopexy or something like that to fix this testis, just in case this person has risk factors or abnormal anatomy that might be making it such that they're going to be more prone to this in the future. Um, also, I completely jumped over what this is. This is testicular torsion for someone, anyone who was confused. This is testicular torsion until proven otherwise. Um, and so it's good to differentiate it from like other similar testicular problems, especially in this um, age range and population. Transillumination test, of course, is not for testicular torsion. That's for something else, which I don't know if we're going to get to later on. So I won't say it, um, but it is another important investigation. Would you ultrasound pre-op? That's a really good question. Um, so generally speaking, you don't go to ultrasound at all, especially if the clinical suspicion is super high because it won't change the management, which is you will still need to go down for surgery and see what's going on. Um, so yes, technically an investigation that you can do is ultrasound to look for changes in the blood supply of the testis because that's what the major thing you're gonna see on ultrasound is messed up arteries um, and reduced blood flow. But most of the time that will not change um, how what you do. And also it's wasting time. So you, and time is tissue, as is with the heart, as is with the brain, same with the testes. ED doctors, so, so I've got a message, ED doctors always complain about how long it takes to get a sonographer. <laughs> yeah. So you don't want to rely on that. Um, if you're going to waste another half an hour, that is not good. Yeah, There's like so this I, golden I think, time, right? Six hours to try and get this fixed. Yeah. It's not unreasonable to, to do it if you just happen to have um, ultrasound available. Um, you know, you, you could use it after a manual detorsion to see yeah. uh, if you've I got usually carry one in my pocket. Perfusion. Sorry. I usually carry one in my pocket. Yeah. Ultrasound. Uh, <laughs> I mean, for Doppler ultrasound, that makes sense. For uh, yeah, which, which is the, the ultrasound you'd use here. So it's not unreasonable. Um, mm. uh, but yeah, like you, you'd never wait to do it. Absolutely. Good question, though. Very good question. All right. Next question. Um, I originally thought this was going to be super hard, but again, I, recent pathology. So hopefully this is still fresh in your mind. Seven-year-old girl is brought into your clinic by her dad. Um, they're worried that she's more tired than usual. Her urine looks funny. On exam, you notice that there's some swelling around her eyelids and a urine dipstick is negative for nitrites, but there's three like there's plus, plus, plus proteins. Um, she has not had any recent infections. So you decide to order a 24-hour urine protein and then also preemptively book in a kidney biopsy because presumably you know what's going on. So given the most likely diagnosis, what is the biopsy going to show? Well done. I don't think I need to give you too much time for this one because everyone's already got an answer. The answer here is D. What disease is this? Yeah, brilliant. So this is minimal change disease. Um, we've got the correct patient demographic. We've got the correct set of symptoms, which is that nephrotic, like purely, almost purely nephrotic syndrome. Um, and that's pretty much it. And also like the, the negative things. So no recent infection, no nitrites, et cetera. So thinking minimal change. And really the only thing you see on electron microscopy is effacement of the podocyte foot processes. Um, so you won't see no change. So there's still minimal changes. 
uh, just something you'll need to use EM for instead of the other two. Um, these other options are also really good for you guys to know what they are because they're also pretty buzzwordy, especially B and E. I'm sure most of you might know what the Kimball Steel Wilson nodules are, um, but we might come across that in Endo if that helps. Well done, everyone. Let's go to the next question. Yes, yeah, so a lot of you have also wrote in the chat what you think the other options are. Well done. Um, yes, I would recommend reading up on those because they are quite commonly cited. 45-year-old construction worker presents to your practice with seven months of persistent pain around the sinuses and a cough that is productive of blood. On exam of the face, he's got a collapsed nasal bridge and also a few nasal ulcers. Um, he's also been admitted to the hospital with some urine problems, but he says they weren't able to find out what the cause was. So now it's in your hands. What do you think the diagnosis is for this patient? Um, I've written what blood test would you order? That's not really the question, sorry. It should just read what is the likely diagnosis. But you can think um, what blood test you might order as well. Fantastic. So we promised that we would go over this condition and here it is. This is Wegener's granulomatosis. Can someone tell me what the other name for this is? The one that we were talking about before? GPA, exactly. Granulomatosis with polyangitis. Um, you've also got, you know, variants of this. So Scherg's, Scherg or Scherg? I don't know. Scherg Strauss syndrome is also one of those. That's like the eosinophilic version of this. Um, good pastures is, is the common sort of mimic, I guess, that we talked about previously. Um, IgA nephropathy and asthma are not related here. Um, I guess what the, the giveaways are is the collapsed nasal, nasal bridge. Um, so that's pretty, not pathognomonic, but it's very close to that for this condition, as well as just nasal ulcers and that sort of thing, plus the urinary changes. Well done. All right. So we're looking at a diabetic kidney. Patient with long-standing but well-controlled diabetes has been recently discovered to have renal involvement after routine urine tests revealed protein urea. Further kidney evaluation demonstrated raised urea and creatinine with a decreased GFR. So which of the following do you think is false? Um, and I also think that this slide basically summarizes everything you need to know about um, diabetic kidney disease. So if you can understand why each of these things, each of these options are true or false, that's all you, well, from my perspective, that's pretty much all you need to know because you will cover this more in endocrine. Sorry, I forgot to say um, for the previous one, it's that thing is called a saddle shaped nose. If that's, if it's given as in that terminology, it means the same thing. So collapsed nasal, nasal bridge, saddle shaped nose. Yay, fantastic. So everyone has picked E for this one. The, the answer is E, definitely. So remember, this is false. Um, what is another name for what is being described in A, which we have seen before? Nodular glomerulosclerosis. Yeah, so Kimmel Steel, Kimmel Steen Wilson nodules. Um, B is a really interesting one, and I'm so happy that no one has picked this because it's a trick question there. Um, in the early stages of diabetic kidney disease, you can actually have quite high GFR. And that's the way I like to think about it. Obviously, the pathophys is different, but it's usually like the shock phase of um, diabetic kidney disease. Oftentimes, it's where the you know, like highly concentrated urine, you've got just acute damage to the kidney. So you have this like diuresis happening. Eventually, though, you have so much damage that there's literally not enough filtering mechanisms in the kidney to even help um, uh, to help process the urine. And that's why you end up with gradually reducing uh, GFR and chronic kidney disease over time. So that was really good that you guys have noticed it. Um, you should definitely assess other organ systems. Um, and yes, diabetic nephropathy is the leading cause of end-stage renal disease in high-income countries, which is crazy. So there we go. Well done, everyone. Oh, and uh, the reason why E is wrong is because you would give ACE inhibitors, not prednisolone. ACE inhibitors, um, great for protein urea. Fantastic. Next question. Elderly gentleman has come into the clinic um, with concern. So we've got another similar urology question. Constantly getting up at night to urinate. Takes him some time to get the stream started. And at the end, it usually feels like there's some uh, pee left in his bladder. This is really starting to bother him. And he is sometimes incontinent in public. 
On DRE, you palpate asymmetrically enlarged non-tender prostate. PSA comes back as elevated. I've been naughty and I haven't given you PSA values, which is, so James is probably shaking his head right now. He's not, but he will. He does not have any systemic features or kidney involvement. Given the most likely diagnosis, what is the next step in management? I'll give you a few seconds. Great, brilliant. Well done, everybody. So yes, uh, obviously for this sort of case, given that it's not an extreme version of BPH where you've got proper obstruction, you've got kidney failure or something like that, um, the first thing you would start off with is medications. So you can start them on alpha blockers like tamsulosin. There's also combination medications like tamsulosin um, finasteride, which comes as duodart or other preparations that, that you can take. Um, but alpha blockers are like the baseline. Like that's what you usually give. And then you can add on finasteride or duasteride. Um, the TERP surgery is the gold standard, but you don't subject someone to that if they don't need it necessarily right now. Because TERP, um, as you may have read up, has its own set of complications, which can be quite devastating. It's like any surgery, right? You don't subject someone if they don't need it. So you would normally start them on medication first. Not long-term urinary catheter that carries a bunch of risks, unnecessary as well. Onc referral is not necessitated because you have palpated the DRE, uh, you palpated the prostate on DRE. doesn't seem like it's like a nodular or asymmetrically enlarged prostate. And you would not reassure and discharge because they're clearly quite frustrated and bothered. So you shouldn't dismiss this. Well done. This looks like a James question. Just has that vibe to it. Uh, it is one of my questions. We go ahead. What do you think is going on here? I'm getting some not so confident answers. I'm not even going to pretend like I would have gotten this right, James. <laughs> it's a good question. It's a really good question. <laughs> all right. Although they're all not, not very uh, confident, we are getting sort of a, a consistent thread, so I think I'll address it. So... Let's look at our options here now. I've got two options here, which are types of bladder cancer and three options, which are types of renal cancer. Um, and I've been mean and I put in risk factors for, um, well, features of both, right? So um, hematuria is non-specific for either of those. Um, in people past a certain age, honestly, though, like painless hematuria, you really want to talk about bladder cancer. Um, so that's not an unreasonable differential to have at all in this case, especially the pack year smoking, sorry, the 30 pack year smoking history. That's, you know, quite bad for, for bladder cancer. It's a big, it's a big risk factor. Um, so we could go down that path, but he's talking about left flank pain. And flank pain is not usually an associated symptom of bladder cancer, right? That's more of a kidney cancer thing. Um, and the fact that he's got a, a blottable left kidney, unless he's got, you know, a, a bladder cancer that happens to be obstructing his left ureter or something, probably we're talking about a renal cancer. So then we're looking at our three types of renal cancer. So we've got chromophobe, papillary, and clear cell. Um, chromophobe and papillary are both pretty rare. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're the wrong answer. Um, so then we've got one more weird thing, which is that he's got a family history of some cyst and some other cancer, pheochromocytoma, um, in his family. Now, somebody uh, did give me uh, the syndrome behind this in the answers. I'm curious if anyone else can make a guess as to why. Yeah, good. Okay. All right. Other people have also got it as well. Good. So it is VHL. All right. Um, so very, very strong genetic association with clear cell renal carcinoma, which is the answer, E. Um, and that's exactly what this guy has. 
Um, so yeah, well done, guys. Really good. Very good. Very, very good. Here's the next also question. Also, unbalance of probability. Oh, Renal, uh, clear cell is actually the most common by a pretty big margin anyway. So um, yeah, either way, you went down. It's probably that. Well done. <laughs> awesome. Here's another question. A 37-year-old truck driver has come to the ED and he's got blood in his urine as well as mild flank pain. He's panicking because he remembers that his father unfortunately died after presenting to the hospital for a very similar reason. Aside from hypertension, he aside from hypertension that was found incidentally at a checkup, he's otherwise well. Urinalysis is inconclusive, so a decision is made to perform a ultrasound of the kidneys, which shows multiple cysts. I wonder what that is. The likely diagnosis is explained to the patient alongside the fact that it is most likely inherited from his parents, his father. Which other investigation would also be most important to perform in this patient? I want you to think about complications of this condition, especially complications that might be quite relevant to this patient, given his occupation. Very, very good, everyone. So the answer here is C, 100%. We're doing a magnetic resonance angiography of the brain. We're looking at the arteries of the brain and the veins of the brain. The reason why is because this patient most likely has autosomal dominant PKD, polycystic kidney disease, as we can see with multiple cysts on the kidneys, the hypertension, bleeding, all of that sort of points in that direction, as well as the familial component. So it's all pointing there. Um, and we're thinking about complications that would be relevant for this patient. Of course, any patient, you're really worried about these sort of like berry aneurysms that are linked with ADPKD because they can rupture, you get subarachnoid hemorrhages, that's not good. And you want to get on top of those, screen for them as quickly as you can. Especially in this patient, truck driver as well, um, additional sort of risks, right? If you, this person is obviously driving a massive truck, they have some like a berry aneurysm that even if it doesn't rupture, if it has um, like mass effect, that might not be great for someone of that occupation. So it's even like sort of doubly important to have this investigation done. Um, some of you also highlighted that there might be hepatic cysts. So you can do liver related things, but not as, um, I guess, not as important or urgent to do that. So we're asking about the most important one. Can someone tell me, so we've identified those two complications. Another really important one I think you should know is something in the heart. Something to do with one of the valves. What's another complication to do with the valves um, that can happen in ADPKD? Fantastic. So mitral valve prolapse is a big one as well. So that might be a consideration um, to do like an echo or something like that. Good job, everyone. Something we haven't touched on for a while, which you would have expected we would do earlier, is actually this sort of presentation. So a 57-year-old woman. Um, comes to your clinic with burning pain on, on urination, as well as urgency for four days. And otherwise, well, never had this problem before. Renal function has slowly been declining over the past seven years. Um, you perform a dipstick, which shows pyuria and nitrites, and you decide to send off a urinary MCS. A few weeks later, you hear that the same patient was admitted to the hospital with fever and vomiting, was later found to have pyelonephritis since she didn't complete the antibiotics that you would have given her. However, they were able to treat her as an inpatient, so she's all fine now. So what antibiotics would most likely have been given to this patient in light of their pylo? Yeah, so the inpatient antibiotics, what is generally given for pyelonephritis? And I say generally because at clinical practice, obviously, low, um, we have like Australian guidelines, there's more local guidelines, so some people might follow different um pathways, but I'm drawing from ETG, which is where we should be drawing for exams at least. Fantastic. So yeah, there's a lot of trick ones here, um, and I won't go into the other options because the next question will address them. But the answer here is going to be B. Firstly, it's important to recognize it's pylo, so it's less likely to be oral preparations. Um, it's quite a severe situation. We want to get them systemic. So IV is usually where we're going, so that's B, D, or E. Um, we don't want to do nitro or trimeth at this stage because that is more for usually for UTI pictures, just simple cystitis or something. Um, so in this case, we want to cover a lot more. And that's why we're going to be giving them IV gent and amoxy. So hopefully that makes sense. So just remember pylo, we're more likely to give it IV and it's generally a preparation of gentamicin and amoxicillin. In a similar way, we draw it back a bit. Um, I think this is actually supposed to be 
a question that came before. I think when we were rearranging it, it might've gone the other way. That's okay. So we've got the same patient. Just forget that she was admitted to the hospital later on. Assume that we've given some antibiotics. What antibiotics would it have been for this simple case of a UTI? So once you're ready, um, type your answers in the chat. Yeah, so this is a bit of a tricky one. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. So you can technically give either trimeth or nitrofurantoin. Those are both generally considered first line. There are some considerations, though, in terms of contraindications or relative contraindications, just to be slightly familiar with. One of the major ones that you will learn in fourth year is to do with pregnancy and sort of what trimesters, uh, you know, each of these would be acceptable in. But not looking at that because it's not relevant here. Trimethoprim is generally okay for most patients, but in patients who already have really bad renal function, which this patient has, um, especially it's been quite steadily declining over the past seven years. I admit I haven't given you much of a quantitative idea of how bad the renal function is, but you may want to avoid oral trimeth because that is the reason why is because one of them is filtered, one of them is not filtered in by like via the kidneys. So there's the pharmacology there for you. Trimeth is the one that you need to be wary of because it can build up if you have renal problems. So nitrofurantoin is more freely dissolved, and so therefore it's a lot safer in patients who have renal problems. You can also give KEF if I'm not mistaken. KEF is also something that is often prescribed, or at least I've seen prescribed for some cases of UTIs. But for the purpose of your exams, trimeth and nitro are the commonest. Okay, awesome. And this is the last question, which I believe I'll ha uh, handball back to James. I think this is yours. Yes, sir. Go for it. So we've got a interesting little picture here. Question is, what's going on? Sorry, just before you explain this one, James, I will just clarify because a few people are asking. The answer to the previous question was C, um, purely because trimeth is usually avoided with renal problems. All righty. I'm getting a couple answers sliding in. If you have something that you're sitting on and you're not quite sure, send it through and we'll see what we're thinking. You got nothing to lose. This is the last question. Go wild. All right. I think most of the answers that I've seen filtering so far um, have been along the same lines. So let's talk about what's happening here. Um, now, I've been mean here, um, which seems, seems a bit of a trend today. Um, but the set of LFTs you have here are not actually the LFTs you're um, evaluating for the purposes of, of this question, right? So um, she's got elevated bilirubin, elevated ALP, and elevated um, GGT. Uh, because she has acute cholecystitis, all right? Um, that's all well and good, but um, it doesn't necessarily um, tell us much about what we're actually trying to elevate. So what we're actually trying to evaluate, which is the blood that happened on her GP visit, okay? So um, at the time, um, the bilirubin being elevated is part of a you know potential cholestatic picture, um, but now it's a bilirubin elevated in isolation. Now she is, as far as we can tell from the stem, completely asymptomatic apart from that. Um, and if you guys know your path or um, your investigation interpretations, you will have heard that there's a very particular diagnosis for asymptomatic 
um, idi not idiopathic, but um, isolated uh, elevation of bilirubin, which is Gilbert syndrome. Um, and the pathophysis of that one is that the, the body has an inbuilt um, error of bilirubin metabolism. Um, and so you basically just get a buildup of that where normal people would be able to eliminate it more quickly um, and metabolize it. Um, it's not dangerous, right? So the treatment for this is basically don't do anything. Um, but it is a good thing to be aware of, if only because you want to have an explanation for people if, you know, they have an isolated bilirubin and you don't want to be freaking out about um, having an elevated um, bilirubin. Of course, when you get to heme and stuff, you'll have other things that you need to rule out. But um, if anything, that only makes it more important to be aware that there is something um, that could explain it. 19 year olds is not unreasonable for um, when it pops up you know people will not notice unless it comes up on blood tests because um it's asymptomatic um but it does usually manifest in sort of, you know young teens and upwards so yeah something to watch out for i think that's the end guys i think that I is the promised. end 7 well 27 done. three Good minutes start. early what can i say we're getting better by the week absolutely i'll stop the recording